Hey, Patrick, can you Kale manage this? No. No, 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 no. Hey, Stone? Stone? Where'd he go? Good news, we have a mostly positive review today of the EK Elite AIO. This thing is heavy. It's, it's heavy enough that it could probably be used as a flail if it were the 13th century. And it's also decked out with six fans. So we've done some interesting testing here given the opportunity where we've done some standard push-pull versus just push. And that allows us to test three versus six fans. So you get some additional information here even if you're not interested in this specific AIO, there's still some information to be had as to how much it really matters to add those extra fans on the other side of the radiator. And this cooler is one of the more expensive ones, but there are cheaper variants, and the line in general competes most directly with Arctic's Liquid Freezer 2 line and to some extent the Lian Li Galahad. The Liquid Freezer 2, of course, has been one of our top recommended coolers for several months now, and EK's AIO, last time we looked at a version of it, was the closest competitor and gave Arctic a run for its money. So now it's back to see how this one does. Before that, this video is brought to you by ASUS and the ASUS Tough Gaming B550 Plus Wi-Fi motherboard, ready for AMD Ryzen CPUs. The Tough Gaming B550 board comes in ATX and Micro ATX variants with key features, including a Wi-Fi 6 module, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, a fanless chipset heatsink for quiet operation, and a focus on stability and uptime. Learn more about the Tough Gaming B550 Plus Wi-Fi motherboard at the link in the description below. So clearly there are a lot of cables. This is this is really not that far off from what I have to cable manage uh, every day. But other than that being an obvious downside, the cooler itself is pretty well designed. And the biggest thing that did well in our testing that we're really excited to show is the pressure testing because it's produced one of the most even pressure maps we've ever seen in a cooler review. So that's kind of exciting because it's it shows us what the truly good end of pressure application looks like across an IHS. EK has unfortunately pulled an NVIDIA, it's or an Intel, depending on how you look at it. It's made its product stack a little bit confusing. So there are multiple variations now. If you go on Amazon especially, it's confusing because Amazon is presented in a way where it makes it look like there's 36 combinations of AIO from EK. That's not actually true. It just looks intimidating like that. But the Elite 360 DRGB is the one we're specifically reviewing. This cooler is $200 on Amazon. EK sent it to us for review a while ago, and we've just now gotten to it finally. But EK previously sent us their basic or standard EK AIO. It doesn't have the word Elite in the title. That's the key difference between this one and the one we reviewed previously from EK. So to go through the variants first and make sure everyone's on the same page, the main coolers you would see on Amazon at least, a Newegg and EK store would be a $200 EK Elite DRGB 360. That's what we're reviewing today. There are other sizes, of course. There's a $150 EK DRGB cooler as well. There's a $120 basic cooler without any of the RGB. And then there's also a gold finish EK Elite DRGB. So the cooler we're reviewing today, except with gold on it, that's an extra $20 to $30 at about $230. So there's a, a non-elite AIO, that's the regular AIO. It's called basic on Amazon. It doesn't have any RGB, except some of them do. Uh, there's the versions that have the RGB pump block. There's versions that have the nickel plated pump block, the pump block being the part we made fun of last time when we reviewed an EK cooler. And then the Elite and the Aurum critically come with a fan hub and six fans. So that's the big difference. The naming is catastrophically confusing when you first look at it. We've gotten the handle of it now, but EK could probably use some help in this department. Either way, let's get into the review of this thing. Its closest competitor in performance will probably be the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2, the 360, and that's about 125 bucks on Amazon. No RGB LEDs on that, though, and that's fine if that's what you want. And then the Lian Li Galahad would be another competitor. The most immediately obvious part of the EK Elite isn't its shiny black nickel housing or its sleeved tubes. Instead, it's the Medusa of cables that dangle from the cooler as soon as it's pulled out of the box. The EK Elite is a nightmare of cabling and cable management. EK does its best to try and facilitate cable management, and its marketing page indirectly acknowledges that this is an intimidating amount of cables by highlighting the included EK hub as an assistant for managing them. There are 12 cables for the six fans. Six of those are RGB LED cables, and six are for PWM. 
each RGB LED cable has a daisy chain connection, which makes it look a little bit worse than it may be in reality. The water block then has its own power and LED cable, now totaling 14 cables. The only solution to this would be proprietary cables in the style of Lian Li's older Bora fans. But then the fans are functionally useless in any other application ever, and this would also potentially drive up cost because it makes them less marketable as standalone fans, so EK can't split it into multiple SKUs. It would also receive our ire for producing proprietary connectors that have no outside use case. So the current solution is unfortunately actually the best one for EK. It's just a lot of cables. In fact, it's, it's so many cables that it's more cables than most computers have in their entirety, but so it goes for six fans. As for the EK hub, it's actually one of the nicer fan hubs we've seen. EK has done a good job with this one externally. The hub has a standard fan and RGB control PCB, and then it has a plastic and acrylic housing, which do come together nicely. It's better than just a plain PCB that you get in a lot of other instances. The current capabilities are just 2.6 amps for power. That's a little bit on the anemic side for higher power fans since there are so many headers on it, but it would be sufficient for the six Vardar S fans, which seem to be about 0.18 amps. DRGB can go up to three amps for its current load. The black nickel pump housing is a stark improvement over the previous EKAIO 360 non-elite version that we reviewed previously. We said that one was good thermally. It was in fact one of the best that we had reviewed at the time. And its biggest problem was just how it looked, which is mostly subjective and up to you. Our statement was not too kind. We said that the pump block looked like it was made on a 3D printer in someone's shed in their backyard. The EK Elite solves this criticism with a much better design. As for sizing, the radiator is 395 by 120 by 27 millimeters, and it's aluminum. This is standard for an AIO, and it's not a problem as long as it's built properly. It's got a 20 millimeter core, leaving the other seven to eight millimeters for the housing. The pump block is 80 by 70 by 64 millimeters. It's fairly large, but not prohibitively so, and it's heavy. This thing is dense. The radiator has a fill port. Sadly, it's accompanied with a warranty void sticker. This is one, unenforceable in the US and two, stupid, it's a fill port, but a sticker with a web address uh, with the correct liquid to use and procedure would be more useful and would probably prevent more customer incorrect fixes. EK also packs the box with an insane amount of plastic. At our own business, we've completely eliminated single-use plastics from several of our products. We're working on getting rid of it from others. Our toolkits, for example, we got rid of about 10 single-use plastic bags, and all it took was some engineering work on our end to protect the product and shipping without using single-use plastics for the toolkits. EK has a lot more money than us, so we'd hold them to at least the same standard. We've eliminated nearly 100,000 single-use plastics in our own business across all of our products that have gotten rid of them over the last few years, and we're working on doing more. Just imagine what EK could do, and it'd potentially even improve the product, like was the case with our toolkits. There's an irresponsible amount of plastic waste in the packaging for the EK Elite AIO, and because we know EK is watching this, the defense will be that it'd be worse to fulfill more RMAs for scratches to the housing than to use plastic. And that's true. But you don't need to plastic wrap every single screw, cable, and all six fans individually, especially because speaking of the screws, we were missing one number 6 32 by 6 millimeter screw, but we had an extra 34 millimeter one of those and an extra mounting bracket screw. Fortunately, we have enough other hardware here to supply our own screws that are missing but it was just one of them, and EK should theoretically send a screw to you free of charge if this happens to you. As for the positives, the mounting hardware is excellently designed. Let's talk about that. Installation with these isn't anything unique, but it's pretty easy for how good the mount ends up being. It's extremely firm. There's no wiggle room at all in the pump block housing when you mount it. It doesn't move at all in the IHS, which is great. And before anything else, the correct bracket has to be mounted to the bottom of the CPU block. This takes four screws. It's pretty straightforward. AMD installation starts off with four standoff screws that thread into the standard AM4 backplate. So that's good. Using the standard backplate is the right thing to do for AMD platforms. And at this point, the block with its appropriate bracket can be dropped into place on the CPU socket. Four springs are then manually placed on the standoffs, which will ensure that you're using the same tension each time it's mounted and that over torque is prevented. After this, four cap screws are installed and the block is ready to go. The cabling nightmare can begin at this point, but at least from 
a mechanic standpoint, everything's pretty easy and very secure. For Intel, a different bracket set is installed to the bottom of the block as a standard, and a custom backplate is used, also standard for Intel, since Intel doesn't include its own backplate. EK has LGA 2011 screws for HEDT CPUs, and as usual, those thread straight into the motherboard sans a backplate. Using the LGA 11.5X or 1200 screws, the block drops into place and the springs come back out. Cap screws go on last to secure everything. EK's installation instructions here were excellent, and mounting hardware is designed so that the screws bottom out on the threads, as they should, because that means you know that it's installed properly. There's not enough room to over torque it and damage things, from our experience at least, and there wasn't so little that it's wiggling around. Installation for EK is straightforward and easy. There's a lot of hardware involved, it's 18 pieces plus a backplate, but unlike some of the other coolers we've reviewed, that hardware isn't pointless. The mounting pressure of the EK Elite shows that everything has a purpose for this one. Pressure testing will start us off for the objective evaluation. As usual, this testing doesn't necessarily evaluate the cold plate flatness, that'll be the next test, but it does evaluate the quality of the mounting hardware and its ability to spread the pressure evenly over the surface of the IHS. The EK Elite has the best mount we've seen yet. The pressure tests are nearly perfect here. On the 3950X, our two installations resulted in imaging that one is extremely consistent and two shows almost full IHS contact. Our mount was weaker for the second one on the right with the top right missing some coverage while the first test was nearly fully covered, again, except for the top right, where the corner closest to the EPS 12 volt cables in the VRM was lacking just a little bit. The 3800X install, obviously using a different IHS, tells the same story. The only spot that could use improvement in our setup was the top right, near the VRM and the EPS 12 volt cable. But we otherwise have nearly perfect contact. EK outdid itself with this mount, and this likely explains some of the performance that we'll see later. Just for reference, we'll show a few of the previous mounts we've done pressure testing for. The Galahad had obvious gaps in its coverage, the Arctic cooler is unique for its offset versus non-offset mount, and the air coolers produce a less square contact in most instances due to the change in design away from microfins and a water block. EK's Elite is off to a great start here. For surface flatness testing, we measured from a known zero point and tested the depth in microns across the surface. This box plot shows the EK AIO Elite as an equal to most of the other coolers tested, including EK's previous AIO 360. Our Elite had one outlier, around 52 microns, but otherwise it was consistent. The median is what matters the most, and all of this together looks pretty good in our charts. Time for thermal testing. We'll start with our noise normalized benchmarks at 35 dBA, where we set all coolers to the same noise level, but keep their included fans mounted. This ensures that coolers can't brute force their way to the top with unusably loud fans when in a real world scenario. We'll have full speed tests shortly, of course, for 100% speed. With all six fans mounted, the EK AIO stock cooler at 35 dBA measured at 49 degrees Celsius over ambient. This is right between the Liquid Freezer 2 360 and the 420 solutions when the 420 is using the offset mount. EK's Elite 360 is a fierce competitor and gives Arctic a run for its money. But Arctic's coolers don't cost as much money, so they still hold a key advantage. EK has advantages elsewhere, like its overall build quality of the block specifically is very high, and the RGB LED fans, plus their included controller. But Arctic's focus on function keeps it in two of the top three positions. EK lands again one rank down from that with its non-Elite 360, and so thus far the Elite is doing well comparatively. It's not an objective winner in a purely technical sense, but for all intents and purposes, they're basically tied. And subjectively, the accessories and the added features might weigh more heavily for some of you than the performance would. It just depends on what you're building. As for push versus push-pull configurations with three versus six fans, we ran that test again and adjusted the three fan configuration up in RPM to meet the same noise threshold. We'll have another one with the fan speeds controlled rather than the noise levels. So with this test, this takes into account the fact that six fans are louder by neutralizing everyone at the same noise. The end result here was a difference of about three degrees when noise normalized. It's not a huge deal, but it's measurable and it's repeatable, and that's more than we can say for some of the coolers we've done this testing for in the past when they had multiple push-pull configuration fans. It's not particularly worth the expense, but at least it's not purely a gimmick, at least in this test pattern. And you can always take those extra fans off and use them somewhere else in the case for probably greater gains. At 100% fan speed, the EK Elite ended up topping the chart. It's a good battle between EK, 
Liam Lee and the Galahad, and Arctic. The six-fan version was less than one degree different from the three-fan variant in this one, showing no benefit from push-pull when under these conditions. You might still get good value out of those extra fans, though, because again, they're all bundled together anyway. You could just relocate three of them to other spots in the case, and that might also help other components in the system. The Liquid Freezer 2 420 with the offset is about two degrees warmer than the EK Elite, but it's also quieter. EK is running at 55 dBA here, with the LF2 420 at 45 dBA, or the LF2 360 at 43 dBA. The 3 Fan Elite drops to 53 dBA and is still louder than Arctic, but now equals the Galahad. Arctic remains the victor in efficiency at the noise level, but seeds the top of the chart to EK's Elite. This is exactly the type of exchange that we want to see between manufacturers. They're both taking turns one-upping each other. When Arctic came out with the Liquid Freezer 2, EK launched its AIO, and that was pretty competitive. Then Arctic put out the offset mount that improved its performance on AMD, and EK has the Elite. There's actual innovation happening in this space, and that's in the cooling space. If we could see this everywhere, that'd be great for the industry. Closing out then, EK has a, a very good solution for the mounting mechanism. The screws bottom out on the threads and the spring ensures that the tension is more or less the same every time you install it, if you install it multiple times, and the pressure to even across both the CPU IHSs that we tested. So that's great. And performance was basically good. It was a chart topper. The one kind of asterisk we have there is that it's $200 for this, and the extra three fans, we actually don't really think you should leave on the cooler. So the push-pull doesn't do a whole lot for you. In the noise normalized testing, it helped a little bit because you can adjust the fan speed. So a couple degrees of improvement there, which is noteworthy. But we think the better value here would be to basically buy this thing, if, if you do buy it, that is. We don't necessarily recommend buying it. But if you buy this thing, uh, you can make use of this hub and those extra fans by stripping three of them from the AIO and putting them somewhere in your case. If you buy a case that either doesn't come with fans, doesn't have a lot of fans, or has bad fans. Because then you're still getting use out of them and you're probably getting better use out of them if you can direct cooler air into the chassis, say if this is a top exhaust, you can pull air in from the front and that's gonna benefit it. Or you can benefit the GPU, nothing wrong with that either. So that's how we think this would ideally be used. It's, it's a bit unorthodox, not really how it's marketed, but it would actually be a very good use of those extra three fans and they're included anyway in the price that you're paying. But that said, again, very slight difference, couple degrees. Uh, two to three degrees advantage in noise normalized testing with the extra three fans for this specific cooler and 100% speed, it was functionally irrelevant. It was a gimmick at that speed. So can be a difference, but not always. So as far as competition, the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 Series is still the most direct competition to this if you don't want any LEDs and lighting. And we are typically performance focused and function focused. That's how Patrick and I build our computers. And uh, I should say at this point, the Patricks and I build our computers. They're multiple now. They've they've multiplied. Um, so we would be okay with the Arctic Liquid Freezer line because all the RGB LEDs don't really do a lot for us, and the extra three fans don't do a ton. A little bit sometimes. So those are your options. If you like RGB LEDs, then sure. This is an absolute nightmare to cable manage. I'm trying to not use profanities right now because. This, this is hellish to manage, uh, as is all RGB. And you basically have more cables in this cooler than you do in the entire rest of the computer. So keep that in mind. It's not the end of the world. They at least give you a hub with it. You are paying for that, of course. So don't, don't be fooled about that. But it makes it a little easier. So to really wrap things up, performance. We're still saying Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 if you want only performance and you don't care about LEDs. If you want looks and performance, then the EK Elite here is now our chart topper, and it has a lot of LEDs, and they've really, truly resolved the main issue of the pump block, as we said in our first review, looking like it was 3D printed in someone's backyard shed. So just kind of imagine a shed that has a 100-foot long extension cable running to it from the side of someone's house, powering a 3D printer. That's where it looked like the original block was made but that's been fixed. So uh, the Elite does well in our testing and we haven't seen any major issues yet other than missing a screw uh, and costing a lot. And those are things, well, the costing a lot is one that you'll just have to think about. But hopefully that helps you make a decision. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for bonus videos and to help us out directly via both of those sites. And we'll see you all next time.